And turn in your copies of God's Word to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, this is found on page 1191 in the Bibles provided, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Well, we're getting back to this letter, and we're finding that uh, Paul, uh, uh, we found that Paul is in prison. He's writing a last letter to Timothy. Uh, these are things that Timothy needs to do, in part because Paul won't be around to do them. And Paul not only gives Timothy a list of things to do, but helps him build a picture of how he is to go about it, both in his pattern of teaching and regarding his work ethic. And so here now, as I read 2 Timothy chapter 2, the first seven verses. This is the word of God. Let us hear him. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Let's pray. A gracious God, we thank you that you are the Lord who gives understanding. Lord, help us to think on these things, to understand, to, uh, to grasp what you have said. Uh, Lord, to not look past it or uh, search for something that's not in it. But Lord, to hear your word, to believe, to obey. Lord, give of your spirit, we pray. Lord, convict us, convince us. Uh, Lord, make us fit to dwell with you eternally. Lord, we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Christianity is not a disposable religion. I believe this needs to be said because we live in an age where everything is seen as disposable. People buy water in disposable bottles. You can buy a single-use camera. So much of our technologies, especially cell phones and computers, are, are no longer made to be serviced and, and equipped uh, throughout your use of them and, and over many years, but they're made, uh, they're made so that they can't even be upgraded. They're made to be disposed of so that you can move on to the next thing. Friends, it's not just true of stuff. It's true of worldviews. Worldviews have become like that. People aren't thinking and living as if what they believe matters beyond their own mind and are willing to believe falsehoods that will die with them. But if Christianity is made to last, how does that affect the way Christian training is done? How it's passed on to the next generation? Or a related question, if something were going wrong in the way we were handing off the faith today, how would we fix it? Well, Reformation happens when we open God's word, believe it, and obey it. And so here we find Paul writing to Timothy, representatives of two generations of church leaders from nearly 2,000 years ago. How does their relationship so early on show the ongoing maintenance and leadership of Christianity for today? How does this teach us how we are to continue passing on the faith, not only uh, receiving it to our generation, but passing it on to the next and even until Jesus returns? Friends, there is much instruction for us here. There are uh, images that Paul uses of a soldier, athlete, and farmer, and the instruction for all of us is this. Pass it on. Pass it on, soldier, athlete, and farmer. Now first, pass it on as entrusted. We find the chief command in this passage is in verse 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The verb here is entrust. It means to deposit something, to put it under the guard and responsibility of someone. And let's notice how strong this, strongly this theme has progressed in this letter. 
Paul could say of himself in chapter 1, he could have said, I was entrusted. He says, chapter 1, verse 11, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher. Now, Paul has been executing his responsibilities as one who has been entrusted with something. But not only Paul, Timothy has also been entrusted with something. Chapter 1, verse 14, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Timothy has been given specific tasks that he is to accomplish in Ephesus. Timothy has been particularly entrusted uh, by, to these things through Paul. Paul took part in laying hands on Timothy. Paul sent Timothy to different places, including Ephesus, where he's believed to be as this letter is written or is coming to. Uh, Timothy is doing the work of an evangelist. He's an apostolic helper. And ultimately, Timothy has been entrusted to these things, not, not just through Paul, but the one through whom those things come is by God himself. But these verses specify what Timothy has been entrusted with, what he's been entrusted with, the message that he's been entrusted with. Paul speaks of it here as what you have heard from me. Now, I don't think Paul is talking about some secret tradition, more on that in a bit. Uh, Paul is speaking of, of the testimony about our Lord, about the scriptures, which make one wise unto salvation, uh, what Jude calls the faith once delivered. That this message is entrusted fits with what we saw last chapter in regarding the good deposit. This is a conservative task. If we were entrusted, it did not originate from ourselves. The work here is one of stewardship, caring for resources that belong to someone else. Our calling then is not to be inventive, not much less careless, but to preserve what was entrusted to us. But not only to preserve it during our own lifetimes. You see, this entrustment is not to stop with Timothy. Essentially, we have here, I was entrusted, you were entrusted. He says in this verse, entrust to faithful men. Timothy, who has been guarding the deposit, has a duty to pass it on because it will no longer be under your faithful hands. You must be discerning whom you pass it to. They must be faithful men. Paul makes the same point in 1 Corinthians 4, 2. He says, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. The whole point of entrusting and of stewardship is that the deposit be well protected. The word that was passed on, the the, the teaching of Christianity must be passed on faithfully. And a safeguard to doing so is found in what we see next. Pass it on publicly. Pass it on publicly. He says, that which you have heard from me in in the presence of many witnesses. It's public. This is not, most definitely not, a secret tradition. It is public, not private But when would Paul be teaching uh, Timothy in the presence of many witnesses? When did that happen? Well, that would naturally be understood to refer to many of the the teaching venues that Paul used. Now, this would certainly include when the church was gathered together and and there's preaching of the word. But there were also instances where Paul would would go to the synagogue. He would go uh, do open air preaching. And and he didn't, we we shouldn't expect that he did so alone. But he would have been accompanied by Timothy, by others, and of course, all the hearers as well. Paul is saying, what you have heard from me publicly, pass on to faithful men. Could it be that today the church veers from this pattern? It seems to me that in this day, if a man seems like he might be a good candidate for elder, the pastor will meet with him privately over coffee or for one-on-one discipleship. That was a big emphasis maybe some years back, but it still seems to be a very popular pattern, one-on-one. Or if there are, maybe there are a few that are being targeted as potential leaders. There might be a targeted class just for them. And if any has gifts of being a pastor, he, we send him off to seminary. We uproot him from the local church where he has lasting relationships, where he has been doing evangelism. And we send him off to take classes about building lasting relationships and evangelism there at seminary. But how is God going to do, the, do to work on a man that right now the elders haven't yet noticed? Or how are the young boys who are in decades to come, decades down the road, they're going to be leaders of the church. How are they now going to be called to be faithful and and to learn what it is to be an elder or a pastor? Well, there's a pattern in God's word here that is robust, that is meant to extend generations. But if we follow this pattern, what will happen? 
It will mean that in sermons or Sunday school, we would overhear Paul telling Timothy how to go about ministry. And someone will object, well, that's not, hey, that's not relevant enough to to us in the pew. Uh, People today don't want to be bothered unless it will be immediately and specifically, uh, unless it will immediately and specifically have application to them. And so if I were to teach on what an elder or a pastor should know and do and believe, let's be honest, some of you would be tuning out. We have an unhealthy bias against this. When I told a fellow pastor that I was preaching through 2 Timothy, he said, isn't that a book for pastors? But I would remind him that although this letter is addressed to Timothy in its first verses, in its last verse, it offers grace to all of you. It is meant to be public. It is meant to be overheard. And let's not forget that this book also says all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, for training in righteousness. All of this has relevance. Not because any women are to become elders or not that every boy will become an elder, but for the simple fact that elders are to be, as Peter calls them, examples to the flock. The things that are overheard, that are caught and taught as, as, as the leadership is trained are things that are beneficial to every Christian. Part of, part of the problem of today is that the modern education is the modern educational idea that everyone should specialize in just a, a, a very narrow arena of knowledge. And that has affected the church in many ways, such that many chur- in many churches only pastors are taught how to read the Bible faithfully. But friends, I think we should have an, an expectation that everyone should want to read their Bibles. Every one of us needs God's word. I want women to be able to read and understand God's word and to teach teach it as they disciple younger women and their children. Timothy has himself learned the word from his mother and grandmother for crying out loud. So I think Paul wrote this letter fully expecting that women and children would be overhearing it as he is writing to Timothy. All the congregation needs to know what their leaders are trained to do, in part so that they can hold them accountable. Uh, in part because of what I've just told you, that those are examples to the flock. This is, this is ins- instruction for all of us. But also so that they can wholeheartedly submit to those leaders as, as their leadership is coming from the Lord. They're doing exactly what they were taught to do. All this to say that training of church leaders should follow this pattern of being public in the presence of many witnesses. No one lights a lamp and covers it with a jar or puts it in a cellar or or under a basket, but on a stand. Jesus said, what I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and whatever you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Christian teaching should be public, which means both that we should be doing leadership training in the presence of many witnesses, but also that many witnesses should avail themselves of opportunities to overhear. If you are a member of a church that offers instruction for all ages, do you show up? Are you, are you going to be one of those many witnesses that, that need to overhear the things, uh, even if it's not directly at you? There are things that are for you in that. So do you, do you make, your, make it a priority to be there? Or uh, if you hear people are going to, to do ministry, whether it's going door to door, or if they're in, they've invited neighbors over, and they're looking for others uh, to, to be with them, to, to help uh, have, have gospel conversations, why not be a part of that? Even if you won't be the one saying anything, go to pray for them. In the very least, go to remind yourself of the power of the gospel. And the benefits are many, so I won't go into detail. But I'll list a few for you to consider. First, public teaching pushes away secrets. There are some religious sects and secret organizations they're really cults that won't tell you up front what they believe. They will appear very normal, sometimes intriguing, sometimes just cleaned up and friendly on the outside so that people will join them. They seem, they seem like nice people, but slowly they will bring you further and further into their trust, into their inner circles. And once they're confident that they have you and that you appear to be at a point of no return, they will teach you their distinctive heresies. Friends, we need to beware. Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Christian teachers aren't to be like that. We are committed to an open statement of the truth. And also, public teaching promotes faithfulness through accountability. 
Let's say that the next elder of this congregation will be named Frank. This is not a prophecy, so <laughs> and don't look around. We don't, I don't think we have anybody named Frank. Uh, tell me if, if, if we do. Uh, if, if, if Derek, if you're a visitor and you're named Frank, this is going to be awkward. <laughs> if Derek and, I, and the other elders were to teach Frank publicly the content of the faith, and later Frank uh, starts teaching things that are contradictory to those things, everyone who's overheard it, everyone of this congregation that, that, that's been one of these many witnesses can say to Frank, you are departing from the truth because we heard the things from the word of God. You were charged to teach these things, and you're not. And la the last benefit uh, leads us to our next point. That there is, with public ministry, a snowball effect. Teaching one publicly builds up many. So Timothy, pass it on and on. Pass it on and on. And notice how many generations of leadership are here in this one verse. We've been, we're still on verse 2. Paul says, what you have heard from me. There's two generations there. Uh, you is the second gener generation, Timothy. First generation is Paul himself. There's also a third generation, entrust to faithful men. Those faithful men are a third generation from Paul. But also there's a fourth generation spoken of here because those faithful men need to be able to teach others also. There's your fourth generation and beyond. Public teaching has the benefit of snowballing in that as Paul teaches Timothy, the faithful men are already overhearing the teaching. They're learning from Paul and Timothy's example, not just from Timothy later on as a, as a single file chain. And then as Timothy is teaching the faithful men, if he does so in the presence of many witnesses, then there is an overflow to others also. Instead of the church being a single file, singly linked, one generation to the next, it becomes double and triple linked. This model becomes conducive not just to single file sustaining of leadership, but to multiplication, even exponential increase of leadership potential. This redundancy was important then as it is now. Persecution was rising then. People were hostile to the truth, not unlike times we find ourselves in today. Paul, furthermore, was in chains. Paul was expecting to soon depart this life, and Paul was acting in accord with the conviction that the church must outlast him should the Lord tarry. Now, I suspect that's not a conviction that anyone can hold on to if we take our eyes off of Jesus. We'll see the waves around us. We'll begin to sink. We'll despair. We are the last generation of the faithful. But if we fix our eyes on Jesus, we will hear and believe his words, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. With eyes on him, we will remember that he gave us a commission he told us to make disciples of all nations. So persecutions may arise, but we need to keep teaching the next generation. Don't give up your work. Don't get distracted by the persecution. Don't get distracted by the, the ways that things are getting harder. Keep at what you're doing. Empires may fall and have fallen, but the church endures till he comes again. This is a good reason why Paul tells Timothy to be strengthened, verse 1. Timothy, you're going to need God's grace to keep at this. You are going to need to keep your eyes on Christ. And then Paul proceeds to give three illustrations to Timothy. A soldier, an athlete, a farmer. And I think these three illustrations have everything to do with the task that Timothy has just been given. These are three things he wants Timothy to think over, verse 7, expecting that the Lord will give him understanding. And so we'll, we'll talk about them briefly, each one, but I expect, expect that you need to be thinking about these things in order to apply them. So carry these three with you this week. Okay, soldier, athlete, farmer. Soldier, athlete, farmer. You're getting breakfast tomorrow. Soldier, athlete, farmer. What is this about? Keep thinking about these things all through the week. So Timothy was to do throughout his life to keep applying these things. First, be wholehearted as a soldier. There are two specific applications Paul uh, gives through this one figure of a soldier. The first application is to share in suffering. That is, so soldiers must work as a team to accomplish the mission. That means they all have a share of the danger and the difficulties of war. Uh, Paul is already suffering as a soldier. So he's calling on Timothy not to shirk his duties. Come, come visit me, Timothy. Don't be ashamed of a fellow soldier such as I am. Fight alongside me, even though many others have deserted. Be a good soldier. 
And a second application is here as well. He says, don't get entangled in civilian pursuits. That is, don't get distracted from your work of discipling men as if you were a civilian and not a soldier. At, At wartime, there is a real difference if you're on duty and not on duty. Paul's reminding Timothy, you're on duty. And so elders, you're on duty. Where are the faithful men you are discipling? In what venues are you giving them your time and instruction? Do you have faithful witnesses? And are you being faithful to give them the message that has been entrusted to us from the word? Are you teaching the word? And are you standing against false teachers? Or are you distracted? Friends, distractions can come in many forms. I'm reminded of Acts 6. Uh, think, think of that passage where, where there was a, a dispute about uh, how the, 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 the widows were being uh, handled in, in the, the distribution of, of, of gifts. There were, there were alms that were needing to go out, and some widows were being neglected. This was a real issue and important to the church. It wasn't unimportant. But the apostles knew that they needed to dedicate themselves to what? To ministry of the word and prayer. And so that's why seven were chosen. Are you distracted even by good things from your task that God has given you? You're not a civilian. You're a soldier. You're on duty. The good soldier aims to please his enlisting officer. Timothy, whom are you trying to please? A Roman soldier swore an oath of loyalty and obedience to their commanders. In war, a soldier who violated or failed to carry out the general's order could be punished by death, even if the action had been advantageous to the army. None of this rogue uh, heroism of today that aims to steal glory for oneself. You know, I think this is going to work out great, and I'm just going to disobey so that maybe I'll get some glory at the end of it, or or it might work out. You know, let let me just... That's a bad idea. You need to... You're a soldier. You're part of of an army that Christ is, is equipping. Christian, you're not to seek your own pleasure. You have duty. You have orders. And yet this raises the question... Who is the enlisting officer that Paul is talking about? Who enlisted Timothy? Whose pleasure is Timothy to seek? Now, now Timothy is a soldier of Christ Jesus, verse 3. And it is true that we are to seek our highest, uh, at our highest to glorify God, to obey him, to do his pleasure as it is revealed in his word. Do it out of allegiance to Christ. That is absolutely true. But there's also here a subtle reminder of the reality of personal relationships. Paul had circumcised Timothy so that he could better minister to Jews. Paul had laid hands on him at his ordination. Paul was, in this smaller sense, an enlisting officer. There's a bit of, then, Timothy, do this for me. And friends, I want to point out here that that's not wrong. We can fall into the me and Jesus trap that permeates modern Christianity. We can fail to see that Christ wants us to have deep relationships. He wants us to spur one another on to love and good deeds, to us take part in that. He wants us to submit to godly and lawful authority. He wants us to follow one another as each of us follow Christ. Friends, he wants to sharpen one another as iron sharpens iron, spur one another on to love and good deeds. I already mentioned that. All reasons why we ought not to forsake the gathering together and all reasons why we should be present among the many witnesses. And so, dear elders, be good soldiers. Dear congregation, be good soldiers, but also compete according to the rules. Compete according to the rules. He next moves to this image of an athlete. He says, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Timothy may have many temptations to try to accomplish the things Paul has entrusted to him using different rules, different methods. Timothy, especially given his timid disposition, uh, might, have, uh, might have thought it would be easier to teach the gener- next generation, let's just do a one-on-one. I really don't like standing in front of people and talking. Well, no, Timothy, this is what's best. And it may be hard medicine right now, but this is for the good of the church. This is for the glory of Christ. Do it. Now, Timothy, uh, in other contexts, he, uh, he might have found it easier to stand against the false teachers by writing an angry email. Or, okay, they didn't have email back then, but, you know, the ancient equivalent, instead of standing against them publicly. As mentioned, sometimes we think of new ways to teach the next generation. We think of new ways to do things that aren't consistent with the way the scriptures lead us to do it. Uh, let's have a targeted instruction class, and only those we think will be leaders should come. 
But Paul uses a sports analogy to say there's no winning in that. In the year 2000, the Spanish basketball team won the, the championship at the Paralympic Games. Uh, this would be the Olympics that are for people with mental or physical disabilities. And uh, they were applauded. They, 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 had, they had won, and, and they, they did really well as a team. The only problem is they cheated. This was a group of men that weren't disabled. <laughs> they faked it. They won the games, but there was no glory in it. And when it came out, there was only shame. Paul is saying, an athlete's only going to get the glory. He's only going to get the medal if he competes according to the rules. There's no medal, no crown, no trophy for using underhanded ways or cunning or tampering with God's word. And so we need to not only shoot for God's goals, but we need to use God's means of reaching them. And we need to stop making celebrities of, of people that, uh, oh, this guy's teaching some really good things in this arena. Well, friends, we need to, we need to pray for them to, to, have, to, to have accountability. We need to pray for other structures that would help them. We need to compete according to the rules ourselves first. And there will be a reward, which Paul speaks to in a third illustration. He says to work hard as a farmer. Work hard as a farmer. There's a blessing for you, Timothy, in this. There is blessing in the Christian life. There is blessing, elders, leaders. There is a blessing in pursuing and obeying Christ. There is a reward, but, but the reward is not for half-hearted labor or for slack-handed service. Work hard. The harvest will come, and the laborer deserves his wages. You will get a first share of the crops. Even though Paul is in prison, he's reminding Timothy that there is reward in the work that he does. Even anticipating, Paul's, or sorry, even anticipating Timothy's visit is a share of Paul's reward. Paul has been pouring into Timothy's life, teaching him, training him, making Timothy what he is in many ways. Timothy didn't have a believing father. And Paul, in some ways, is expecting a benefit from him. Timothy, come visit me. Bring the cloak. Bring the books with you. Paul is getting some of this blessing even now, but that's, that's only a slight uh, blessing compared to eternity where we will be with one another, where those that we have poured into, we'll get to rejoice in how God ultimately one, one planted, another watered, but it was God through every one of us that was giving the growth. It is God who has worked in our lives and we praise him even as we, re we enjoy the blessings that he gives, which yes, uh, uh, yes, the, there is reward for, 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 uh, for hard work, but even then it will be by grace. And so we will rejoice by him, in him. Friends, uh, this uh, sharing of blessings is actually Paul's own language. You see, Paul used these same three illustrations. What were they again? You're going to remember when you shave tomorrow or when you eat breakfast. Okay, yeah. I'm remembering myself, sorry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this is terrible. All right, soldier, athlete, farmer. Woo, that was, all right, soldier, athlete, farmer. Why, okay, the, these three, soldier, athlete, farmer, he's used these illustrations in another chapter. This isn't the first time Paul's used these. And Paul uh, would be familiar with this uh, other time we spoke of it. Timothy would be too. And so when he says a soldier, athlete, a farmer, he's referring us to 1 Corinthians 9. When Paul tells Timothy in verse 7 of this passage, uh, he's telling him uh, of, of, uh, to, to think about what he says. He has in mind what he, Timothy has already heard Paul say in that other letter. So we need to think about it, verse 7. You see, there in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul said, If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? You see, Paul has a right to ask Timothy to come to him to share in suffering by visiting him, to share in suffering by being faithful in the calling God has entrusted him, to labor hard by entrusting the Christian faith to the next generation and beyond. That's not Paul being selfish to ask for that. It's Paul being gospel-centered. As he also says in 1 Corinthians 9, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. You see, Paul wants to share with Timothy in gospel blessings. And Paul wants 
Timothy to be thinking of those faithful men. Timothy, I want you to be setting your eyes on the joy that you will have with them, not only of training them, not only getting that, that, that solid time, getting, getting together, talking about the Lord Jesus, rejoicing in what God has done, but there's going to be blessing that's going to come that, that you can't even expect now. Friend, see all the more, let that spur you on. Friends, it's about the gospel, and yet it comes with great blessing. The blessing you, you will share with them, not only in this life, but in eternity. It's all about the gospel. It's about Jesus Christ, that he be made known to be the mediator between God and men, the great high priest, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the Prince of Peace. And that's worth passing on. This is the eternal gospel, which will never be discarded. It is to go not only from to us, it's come down to us, but it is to go to the next generation, to our kids, to, to our kids' kids, to, the, to those that are, will come on and on until Christ comes again. And yet, how does, that, how does that mean we ought to live now? We need to teach publicly. We need to do these things in the presence of many witnesses. We need to be wholehearted, follow the rules. And yes, friend, there will be reward in it. And so therefore, let us be faithful to pass it on in the presence of many witnesses to, many, to faithful men who will teach others also. So pass it on, soldier, athlete, farmer. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you... You have some, for some reason that is beyond our comprehension to know why you would do it. You have sought to use mere mortals in accomplishing your perfect and eternal plans. Lord, you will use this generation to pass on the faith to the next. Lord, you use elders, you use Mothers, you use fathers, you use uh, neighbors, you use co-workers, you use, you use us in these various aspects. So Lord, would we be faithful? Would we live as those who, do, who see that Christianity is no disposable religion? But you, Lord Jesus, are the hope of the world. And so Lord, help us to teach publicly, help us to love accountability, and Lord, to, to look to ways that we are to learn, even from things that, uh, that will take work to apply to our lives. Lord, help us in this. Lord, be with, be with that next generation. Be, Lord, give us faithful men in this church. Lord, bring along others also. Lord, that until you come again, you would sustain your body and you would glorify your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.